Go back to six days ago in '62, and I think uh, she knew very well to show. People like uh, Air Marshal J.R., who was Eastern uh, Command in Chief, Eastern Command, uh, he, he told me that he was sitting in his Suga Mystere in on the days to airfield. Ready to take off because they're expecting orders to deal with the Chinese. In 62. That's right, in 62. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. with the with Harbach as a four corps commander right there calling in. Yes, you know, calling a strike and stuff. They were ready to go. Yeah, but, but my boss, HG Master Fitness, was in the cockpit of Alwar. Ready to go in a, in a, in a, in a hunt. <laughs> but the orders never came. Yeah, the point I think is that they're not just ready to go, they turned on the engines. And they're sitting there with the airplane shuddering to take off with the brakes on. And order came down, stand up. Now, the frustration is precisely because, by the way, the real reason was BC Roy, who was then the Chief Minister of West Bengal, uh, as perhaps some of you recall, um, told him, please don't use the aircraft to bomb the Chinese positions or the PLA, because they might respond by bombing Calcutta. <laughs> And they accepted that advice. And therefore, our best card, if we could have played against the Chinese in 62, was not played. In other words, the advantage we had, the only advantage we had, was Air Force. And we didn't use it. And this leads me to believe that when we use that advantage, assuming we have it, Air Vice Marshal, in even uh, imminent or imminent um, you know, fracas on the border. I doubt it. The reason being, and the reason I tell you why, why did we vacate, you know, vacate the post on Kailash Range, as some, some of you perhaps read the newspaper? The South Bank of yeah. Why did we vacate them? There's no reason to vacate them. The first real success of the entire encounter with the Indian Special Forces, the Special Frontier Force, uh, you know, the gear for warfare at heights, uh, captured it. And so the Chinese found that they were looking down on the Moldo, Moldo garrison. Yeah. And the Chinese got spooked. <coughs> Why did we give it up without anything in return, adequate return, that we should have insisted on? And in any case, we shouldn't have vacated it because we claimed that to be part of the LAC. So, how come the Indian government decided to withdraw? Virtually unilaterally. Virtually unilaterally. Because they say, oh, well, they're firming up the line on the fingers on the uh, northern Pangong shore and so on. Doesn't make military sense. That's precisely the problem. So when you say that, well, yeah, they have the advantage, when yes, the advantage doesn't matter unless you use it. That's you. Yeah. yeah. May, may, may I just make a point yeah. right in the same thing? Sure. It's not just the Air Force which is ready to go in 62, even Seahawks and Alizes. Had been moved up to Gorakhpur, they were also ready to go. Individual bridges, individual targets, come to a slight correction of what you said. In fact, when I was doing the history of the Air Force in, in 1992, we had just finished interviewing Air Marshal A.K. Devat, who had been with CNC in 71. And I finished my conversation with him, and I was packing up the scenario of mics and stuff like that, when he, he said, I want to talk about 1962. So I looked at him and I said, what about it? And he said, I was ACS Ops. And he came up with something that was so stunning that actually even Air Red Potter went into a virtual paralysis when they heard this. Hmm. Uh, he said the decision to not use the Air Force has been given to, it was a political decision, everybody, all, all, all writers have said that, but actually it was a decision which was brought about by two people. One was B.M. Malik, who for some strange reason advised against using the Air Force, despite the fact that the uh, PLA aircraft had actually uh, defected to Taiwan and the Americans had handed over that pilot to us. We knew China does not have aviation fuel. We knew they can't get out airborne. Nagi Nak was flying his Canberra all over the place, not once in the interceptor. Yeah. And yet we decided not to do it. And what Devan said was that the decision not to do this was mine. And I said, why the heck would you say that? So he called up his log books and he showed me, he was in 7 or 4 squadron during the Arakan operation. And he said, I have two 471 sorry, you will be with the Japanese, we never saw them. So the same thing applies. And he said, have you ever flown in that area? He was CNC East. What are you talking about? Because the passes are so narrow. 
a couple of napalm attacks over there. The Chinese were petrified of this because even on the night before the Lanka Shu attack, they were hauling up anti aircraft guns onto the Thai Valley. Because even one vampire shot him would have changed things. Yes, actually he was a good captain that time. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, he was a good captain that time. And I read that there was a good captain XCD1, XCD1, who moved this thing. Uh, I mean, when you think back to the high time, you really wonder how Amazing. Okay, sir. Amazing. That is a fact. Uh, okay, uh, the point about uh, uh, whether we yeah, withdraw from the, yeah. uh, the hills. Uh, uh, see, uh, the Professor, the point is like this. Finally, it's, uh, it's a political decision, and you at least use the word the government of India. Uh, I don't think any one of us, at least I don't know, what was the reason why we withdrew from there. But yeah. Because when you uh, see from outside, you do feel that why did we? We had a strong point there. And after that, the Chinese have just got their heels in on DPO, the dead sound place. Uh, I found enough in that area to tell you that uh, the way they have moved and now those areas which are a no-go for our troops to patrol brings us <coughs> very close to a track junction and DPO. Uh, I do not know how flying is going on there. We have a different route, of course, available. Uh, but why it happened, one doesn't know. There must have been something really good. Yes, yes. Um, the PLA now has built a bridge, a two-way bridge, to uh, from the northern Taiwan shore to yeah, get to the Hong Kong garrison, and uh, that will, you know, speed up the redeployment or switching of forces the northern shore to Moldova and the LR Shui. Should they ever want to do that, uh, they've cut down the shift time uh, from uh, three to four days to. A few hours, 13 hours, we can bring in a you know, reinforced deployment right into Moldova. I mean, the point to make really is that somewhere, you know, sometime, in, and invariably, so it seems to me anyway, the government of India loses its nerve. It doesn't have the nerve to fight. If I may say so very, you know, perhaps plainly, doing some plain speak. It's happened again and again that we are in these situations and we immediately backed up. So, now, you can say that you, Captain Devan was responsible for the op decision at the time. And V. M. Malik, for those who don't know, was the Bureau, Intelligence Bureau Chief, who was close to Nehru and he was supposed to be the one source intelligence expert in China to Nehru. And he completely misled Nehru all the time. But Nehru should have used his head because he was getting other inputs. Yeah. And he, he was not using it, but that's a separate matter. The point to make simply is this. If you're going to be, you know, if you're going to be a match or try to be a match for China, then you have to be like China in preparing to have war if that becomes necessary in your interest. And so the point, if you're vacated, by the way, the Chinese now have in the, uh, in the water sector, the depth sound sector, virtually taken over some 69 posts. We have lost a thousand square kilometers of Indian territory, and that's a fact. The government India still doesn't acknowledge it. But the fact is, we have lost a thousand square kilometers of territory, critical territory, fronting on the Xinjiang Highway, which we could have otherwise interdicted by land. Had we had the, of course, and we had the will and the nerve and the rest of it, which we don't have. So the point, and the short point to make is, assuming we have all the, our forces are given everything they want, would the government still fight? I think the problem goes a little deeper. I completely lost this, I've been saying the same thing, that the, the psychological hammering that we took in 1962 yeah. will continue to carry that monkey on our shoulders and you know whatever happened in Natula for example has been highly exaggerated and stuff like that. There are incidents like Natula the, the 1986 incident in the Kundra Valley. The main issue here is that we just haven't had the gumption to stand up to the Chinese and the Chinese are basically bullies. They will see wh where they can get the upper hand and they will go for it. And we have just been sort of rolling over again and again and again. And unless we develop that ability to just 
stand them back in the eye uh, and completely remove everything else. So that is one aspect of the problem. The other problem, which, I, which we haven't touched upon, is that our northern border management policy is actually virtually non-existent. I hate to say this in a public forum, but it's a fact. You've got ITBP looking after the northern border. You've got, you know, we are such a mess, we don't know what's going on. The ITBP was not sharing information with the army. The army is on its own trip. Everybody is doing their own thing. The ITBP comes out of the home ministry. We had an intelligence grid where the army was not part of it. I mean, there are major lacunas in our whole functioning. And by putting our head in the sand and pretending that these problems don't exist, they're not going to go away. And they're going to come and bite you in the butt because this is exactly what happened in 2020. The ITBP quickly moves out, army comes in, ITBP is supposed to come under the army, but the ITBP also turns around and tells the army, my pay grade is higher than yours, who the hell are you going to do what to do? You know, these are real problems here. Yeah. And the fact is, unless we have a border management system in place, don't forget that even in Vietnam, it was the border guards of Vietnam who gave the PLA a bloody nose in 1976. We haven't learned from anybody else's, forget about our own mistake, we haven't learned from others' successes or failures either. Just, yes, I don't know to belabor the point, uh, but uh, the that 30 additional, 30 to 40 additional battalions that are now being released in ITBP. What we have to 42 42 what battalions, right? I mean, are you building in the ITBP? It's almost as if Amit Shah wants his own army. That's basically it. The reason ITBP, CRPF, and versus the, uh, the paramilitary is, uh, you know, in a sense, created by Indira Gandhi and given the kind of uh, resources. And so counterbalance. Was to counterbalance the military. Yeah. In those days, there was a real fear uh, in the Indian government that there'd be, you know, what they call a Yukhanitis, you see, a, a, a kind of virus that would uh, come from Pakistan and then to take over. Yeah. And, and that was a real fear, mind you. And uh, so to deal with that, you know, and they did all these parameters, they were completely useless. As military forces, they are nearly completely useless. And you have more of them now being useless. Mm. So just having masses of useless people standing their ground at heights is not going to solve your problem, is it? But this is the kind of thing we do. Things that are not going to be helpful to India's security or India's interests. I need, to, yeah. I need to draw back a little less people go with a different view. Uh, the cutting edge, when the orders come, are the boys and girls now in the front lines corners. Okay? Helicopter units, transport radar units, logistics units. Let me tell you one thing that uh, all that the professor spoke, I was to repeat, sir. Uh, that's for the higher echelons and the interactions what happens between the government and the higher echelons. But the cutting edge, the people who will actually, you know, kill and get killed, unfortunately, are, are, are raring to go, let me tell you that. Oh yeah, yeah both from let's, the let's, let's be clear on this part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, lest anybody gets the wrong impression that the guys up front out there in Leh, Ladakh or Northeast or in Sikkim or the Navy down south, uh, you know, uh, uh, those guys don't have the, 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 the don't to fight, no, far from it. They follow orders. And what the professor said is, the higher levels, uh, where a lot many issues go in before you can actually launch war. It's not a simple thing. So the government takes into account so many other things, political, diplomatic, money, and well, let's face tax elections. Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, all these things play and the government thereafter takes a decision. But uh, the the fighting force is strong in class one, first class. I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, just after the standoff began, after the Galban uh, clash, I, I, one of my privileges is being able to go to these, some of these forward areas. And I was in Ladakh in, um, uh, in um, sometime in late 2020. Uh, just before the operations in South Bangong began. And uh, what Evans Marshall says is absolutely true. I've spent time with, with the airmen, soldiers there, and they are all fully ready. They're prepared like as if, you know, they're going to be ordered to go in tomorrow. So the morale is extremely high. They're fully prepared. But yes, that, that aspect of us being reactive is, is, is ever-present. One can get that sense as well. 
defensive, passive, and reactive. And that kind of an attitude, whether anybody likes it or not, seeps down into the military over time. It cannot be kept uh, isolated from these kinds of means to influence. Uh, that said, is there going to be, is the war imminent? No. But is the war imminent? Yes. Simply because the Chinese are not idiots. They have always gotten by by coercing indirectly or directly and in so far as you are coerced and you do their bidding, there's no war. There will never be any war with China if you give in. So the question is, are you going to give in every time by not fighting? Now, how much of a provocation do you want? They've already occupied territory. Uh, I mean, what is your LAC? Either you stick to your idea of LAC or you don't. Or it's a flexible line. Wherein whatever the Chinese take, they keep on taking and that defines some new LAC. Or you say, no, this is our idea of LAC, we're going to evict you from it. Now, that name is something beyond the Indian military, in practical terms. And that's what the government thinks. I, mean, I don't know what the military thinks of its capabilities. That's what the government thinks. And therefore, you have a real problem. If the war is imminent, meaning it may happen, it happens if, for some reason, we develop a spine in standing up to China. Because, think of it, all the so-called military successes we have had today are basically against a non adversity like Pakistan, isn't it? And be brutally honest, have we had any, we have had successes, and that comes down to the leadership. You had the Sagat Sein in Nathula in uh, 1687. You had the Sagat Sein, Lieutenant General Sagat Sein, who led, and he, he was the man mainly responsible for taking Dhaka, who is not here out there. He couldn't even make army commander. Lesser people made it. And the, fighters, the finest fighting command they ever made it. So you have something wrong in the rewards that you're given in military <coughs> terms. Right? It's an attitude. That's what I mean. It seeps down. People become, as I said, uniform bureaucrats, uniform barbers. They don't want their risk hours. That's fair enough. Because if all you have been acculturated to, is a government that's a little bit cheaper, and you know, let's give it a little bit war nature, you and you know, we have peace. And they say, we have peace in the graveyard. You can happily live in the graveyard next to our homes. That kind of an attitude. So, really, and one last thing, Chip, if there's going to be imminent war, and we are not prepared, because our forces are not equipped to fight, our army is not prepared, we're basically. Uh, uh, the plains warfare army, even now, it will take 25 years for it to become a mountain offensive army. And we have the time. And the other thing is, if we don't, and we are faced with a situation where either we succumb to pressure once again, or we try to be proactive, then would you rather not be proactive? And that's what I've been recommending in my books. What do we do? I say, Use your nuclear weapons as a short fuse deterrent. Keep it forward deploy our uh, Agni 5s, have the Agni 1s and so on, nuclear war hit it, forward deploy them, <coughs> announce it to the world that if anything happens, we will merely react. We will not be the initiators of nuclear war. But if anybody crosses, we will in fact go, use, you know, go strategic. If you don't hold down the threat, there's no threat to hold down with the Chinese. There's nothing else you have, honestly. They're not going to be thwarted and deterred by any of your air force edge that you have with the altitude and the ordnance load you can carry. That's not a deterrent. What's a strategic deterrent is you can take out the Fujian coast with Agni 5s. That's a deterrent. Well, that will send China back to the Stone Age economically. They are going to be the fastest rising economy, it will be the main primary economy of the world by 2040. If we kill that, or threaten to kill that, they will quickly understand. But that means we have to back up our deterrent talk with actual de deployment up front, a very short-fuse deterrent. And one last thing, 
And I, and people mistake what I keep saying that this guy is a hardline, you know, ultra uh, hawk and so on and so forth. That's how cases of money for people define, which is ridiculous. Because the nation's money. And we should have this discussion with all the time in the National Security Advisory Board and elsewhere. But the problem is, and you hear the generals and air marshals and all the military people saying that, which really bothers me, when they say nuclear weapons are for deterrence, mm. not for fighting. I remember mean, they are weapons. They are for weapons. Unless the enemy sees us prepare for using them, there is no deterrence. Deterrence is my field. If my nuclear, you know, nuclear deterrence is my field. I'm telling you, there's no deterrence. That's why China is a hardly going to be bothered if you say, well, they're going to go into an air force, they're going to bring an attack helicopters. No. That's not going to be deterred. I disagree, sir, on the nuclear. <laughs> Almost out of time, so final question to, uh, to uh, I, I basically feel... Uh, but I just want to narrow it down to one final question. You can add to what they've said and also answer my question, which is, what is the road ahead? Is there going to be a resolution to it? Is this the new normal? Is this the new status quo? You know, everyone just lives with this now. Is there a possibility of the Chinese pulling back? For things yeah. going back to a pre-2020? I think we need, to, we need to define war yeah. first. And I think 2019 onwards, we are at war with China. All the potential that there was possibility of some sort of normalcy on the border and that Pakistan was the main threat. And you know, we were behaving like ostriches with our head in the sand. I think all that's gone out of the window. The conflict has, had, had begun. It is not just an India uh, or China thing, it's also the United States and China trusting for world power. The, we are all a bit clearer than this, and the situation is constantly evolving. It is, it, war does not necessarily mean fighters streaming across the sky and missiles going left and right, but the it's, it's, it's been fought at the cyber level, it's yeah. been fought at the economic level, it's been fought at 150 levels, a lot of those levels we are not even aware of. What uh, Professor Kagan has just said in terms of veterans and missiles, and, uh, he's talking nuclear, but I had actually advocated exactly the same thing uh, in 2020 in my own article in with, with, with Sunday Garden. I have also been saying, what's the point of having these missiles if they're not going to very well use them? So deploy them. And in fact, tell the Chinese that we've got them in Simla, we've got them in Dehradun, we've got them here, and in fact they are primed and they're ready to go. If you do anything, we will be here. The way ahead is that, okay, I mean, you've also got to be very careful about not getting blindly pushed into the western corner, because one of the reasons why 1962 Mao did react was because of the CIA involvement in what was going on. We blindly went into certain things. We did allow U2 flight from Kalaikunda. There was a lot of arms shipment from Sikkim, etc. It all added to the Chinese suspicion of India lining up with the United States. That, from their perspective, still remains one of the largest threats that they face. That if India actually gets washed into the Western camp in, with no holds barred, it would be a completely different scenario. And the Americans have always looked at Tibet as the soft underbelly of China. We have to, purely from an Indian perspective, and I've said this time and again, we have to prepare for fortress India. We have to knock off all the other nonsense which is going on about the fault lines that we are so good at creating, Hindus, Muslims, Swiss, people from Punjab, because everything affects us. National security, when we rely, we have to start teaching fortress India. You're sitting in Mangalore today, you're not far removed from what is going on in the Himalayas. If you're sitting in Toronto, you're no, no further removed. I mean, you're as much a part of the whole game. And we just cannot afford to let our, our guard down. And we, you can only quote from what Franklin Roosevelt used to say. He used to say that if you want to walk alone, you better carry a big stick. And whether Make in India and all this stuff is all, you know, there's a lot happening in terms of what is going on. I, I was involved with the Navy. I know that we have built ships like INS Delhi, INS Mysore, and all that way back in the by 1900s, and, I mean, uh, 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 before the turn of the century. And there's a lot happening, the LCA, the Tejas, all these developments are going on, but they're not enough. We really got to get more and more self reliant Be absolutely, be very clear that we, India comes first as far as everything is concerned, and be very careful that we're not actually pushed into the Western thing, unless it suits us. And 
these days are going on. I mean, you know, it's, it's constantly on. I, I disagree on this point that the war is imminent. No, war is already on. World War Two, World War Three began with the COVID outbreak. Yeah. And it's going on. And when history is written 50 years down the line, you'll be wondering why you're sitting here without helmets and you're not in a bunker actually because the situation will look like that. Just one second. Yeah, one last one. Yes, please. You know, you said a very important point. Uh, you know, when you talk of comprehensive national security, societal oneness, societal cohesion is so very important. So, any strife within our society, based on whatever, thinking, ideology, religion, language, whatever, that affects our social fabric. And social fabric, the tenacity of social fabric is so important in comprehensive national security. That's a great uh, word to end this on, but I think we just have about five minutes left.